Hey, let's pray before we get into the word this morning. Father, we love you, and we're excited to be here. We're thankful to be here with our church family. And God, I, I pray right now that you would prepare our hearts as we've spent some time worshiping you, singing to you, giving to you. And uh, right now, we, we want to be receptive to what you would have to say to us. And Father, sometimes the things you say in your word are, are difficult for us, uh, but you always give us the comfort of your spirit and the strength of our relationship with Christ. And uh, you take us through that journey. I, I pray, Father, you'll give us both the strength and the courage uh, to follow through on all that you have for our lives. And Father, that that journey would begin even here this morning. We, we just surrender our lives to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I'll let you get a head start on me again this morning. Philemon is the book you're going for. Philemon is right before Hebrews, right after Titus. So start uh, looking for that. Um, you know, I had the coolest thing this morning. We sing songs about the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and, you know, I really believe that uh, a church without the Holy Spirit is, is not going to get much done. They're not going to get uh, uh, much accomplished in our hearts. And... Uh, we do invite the presence of the Holy Spirit in, into our lives and into our church and into this presence. And, and I wanted to share with you an experience that happens over and over and over here at Cornerstone. I was in my office this morning, had some visitors stop in, and uh, they came into my office after service. And, and through tears, uh, the man said, as soon as we stepped through the door, we knew this was home. That's probably the 20th time. I've had that exact wording come into my office with members that, that build this church. It is the Holy Spirit building this church. He is drawing people here, and I tell you, it's just amazing. As soon as they step through the door sometimes, he, he speaks right to their heart, this is where you need to be. Isn't that exciting? Man, that's just so cool. Well, we are going to finish Philemon. We started last week. There's only 25 verses, so we're going to finish it this week. And I uh, just want to take you through the journey real quick of where we were at last week. This was a, a letter written to Philemon from Paul. Uh, the issue is we have a runaway slave. From the best we can tell when we put the puzzle pieces together, we have a slave that has run away from his owner. He has stolen some things, dishonored his master, and got as far away as possible. He was over a thousand miles away when he bumped into Paul in Rome. And there, Paul's witness changed this slave named Onesimus, and he was saved. And Paul began to work on this relationship, trying to reconcile the two back together for the glory of God. Now, last week, we looked at the life of Philemon. Philemon is an incredible man. Uh, from verses 4 to 7, we saw that Philemon had this uh, deep faith anchored in Christ. It affected his testimony and interaction with other Christians. Uh, he had uh, what Paul called um, a, a, re a refreshing spirit. Uh, people found comfort and joy in him. His love that came from Christ was just uh, like glue to other people. People got around Philemon, and, and they just had their spirits refreshed in him. He was a source of joy and comfort. Philemon was a great guy, a mature Christian. And we talked about some of these, uh, these important factors in our own lives. If we're going to be people who reconcile relationships in our own hearts, we have to have this anchor in Christ and a love from God that works through us and goes uh, and, and loves others unconditionally. And, and we need to be the kind of person that can uh, be a source of joy and comfort and just a safe place uh, for people in their walks with Christ. So we, we, we focused on Philemon last Sunday. Now, this morning, we're going to look at the rest of the characters in the book. And, and, and there's, there's a centrality of the gospel in this book. Uh, as we look at this process of restoring relationships, reconciling uh, either uh, people to God or people to people, the gospel is central in that work. And what I want to do is just kind of take a person here, 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 and here that are in this letter and say, this is where they were at in this process. This is how the gospel worked in that process for them. And then at the very end, I'm going to show you a key. I believe the key to Philemon. And uh, we're going to wrap the whole thing together and allow the Lord to speak to our own hearts as to how we move forward from here as obedient servants of Jesus Christ. So let me begin uh, in verse 8 is where we left off. And I'm going to read verses 8 and 9. And we're going to start with Paul. And Paul 
is dynamically driven by the gospel. Everything this man does, he's driven by the gospel. Let's, let's see. Oh, we're going to read a couple verses, then I'm going to skip down. I'm, I'm just taking little snippets out of this letter that, that show the heart of Paul. So starting in verse 8. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. All right, Paul still uh, considers himself a prisoner for Christ, just like he introduced himself in this gospel. Uh, he, he, he's not a, a prisoner of Caesar. Uh, he's he's going to continue to live by the gospel no matter where he's at, in house arrest, in prison, uh, or out on the mission field. Uh, listen to Paul's heart, too. Let's skip down to verse 17. And just continue, as he's, uh, he just had a conversation uh, building up Onesimus the slave, uh, reaching out to Philemon, uh, that he would bring him back into relationship with him. And after pleading with those two, he says in verse 17, So if you consider me your partner, receive him, Onesimus, as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all, he, if he owes you anything, charge that to my account. Verse 19, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me even your own self. And here we find out that even Philemon came to Christ through the witness of Paul. Verse 20, yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. I believe when Paul says that I want some benefit from you in the Lord, I, I want to see you glorify Christ with your life. I led you to Christ with the gospel, and now I want to see you shine for Christ. I want to see you advance his kingdom. I want to see you shine brightly uh, for the kingdom of God. I, I want that return. I want some benefit from you and the Lord it, from my investment. So here Paul is sharing his heart to Philemon. He is, he is seeing, I uh, have Philemon over here and Onesimus, two people that I've led to Christ, and there is a rift between them. Onesimus has seriously wronged Philemon. And Paul wants to do whatever it takes to bring these two back together. And he's personally invested in it. In fact, listen to his wording. Uh, he says, uh, charge that to my account. If Onesimus has taken something, if he's stolen something, uh, charge it to my account. I will repay it. He's put some personal skin in the game here. Paul is willing to make some sacrifice on his own behalf to make sure that this relationship can be restored. He's, he's serious about God's reputation in all of this. And, and when we say that Paul is dynamically driven by the gospel, I, I want to just, Paul has the, the, a, a testimony that wraps through the whole Bible. He has more words shared about him than probably any other person when it comes to his testimony. So if we were to read through the book of Acts, we would see a lot about how this drive takes place in the life of Paul. Well, for one, we would see in Acts chapter 7, uh, where, where Saul at that time kind of steps into the scene. We have Stephen, uh, who is uh, preaching and professing Christ to an unbelieving crowd of spiritual leaders, Pharisees. And, uh, and he's about to be stoned. And as he preaches Christ to them and teaches them that Christ is the Messiah that we are seeking... The Pharisees take the stones, and they stone Stephen to death. And as he loses his life, Saul is standing by. If you read Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And Saul approved of his death. So, so Saul was not uh, a church kind of guy. He was not into the new movement where these followers of Christ were coming out of. He wanted to stop it. He was zealous about it. He was sincere about it, but he was sincerely wrong. And it was in Acts chapter 9 that Jesus got a hold of him and introduced himself to him and radically changed the life of Paul. He did so much that he changed his name from Saul to Paul. And here on that road to Damascus, Jesus took Paul to a different kind of school. Paul was already very educated. He was a Pharisee. Uh, he describes himself as a, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, extremely well educated. But Jesus takes him to a different kind of schooling and fills him with the Spirit and begins to teach to him what it means to live a Christian life empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And, and boy, does it ever get a hold of Paul. It just, everything he does is, is affected by the gospel. He goes into a church in Antioch. It becomes his home church. 
and the Spirit sends him out on three different missionary journeys. Acts chapter 13 and 14 is his first missionary journey. Goes out to the Roman province of Galatia, plants a bunch of churches uh, with Barnabas, John Mark, and, and starts little cells of, of Christian believers. Goes back to Antioch. They send him out again, round two. Uh, this was Paul's call to Macedonia. So he goes to the Roman province of Macedonia, to Achaia, plants some more churches with Silas, goes back to his home church. Does the same thing on, on a third missionary journey. Goes to the province of Asia, plants more churches, is reestablishing the connections of his old churches, strengthening them, encouraging them, fixing some of their problems. And then he's arrested by the Jews. So he goes on three different missionary journeys, and then he endures two different imprisonments. Uh, Acts, Acts chapter uh, 18, all the way to the rest of the book, starts describing the first imprisonment that uh, Paul endured. And, and there was portions of it that were in Jerusalem and Caesarea and Rome. And I think Rome is where uh, he wrote this book, sitting in house arrest. And through all that time, he never gets discouraged. He's singing songs of praises. He's praying. He's writing correspondence to his church. It doesn't matter to Paul where he's at or what the opportunities are. He's going to grab everything he can for Christ, whether he's sitting in prison or planning a church. It, the guy is dynamically driven because of the sake of the gospel. I love Paul. We need more Pauls in our midst that just, it doesn't matter where you're at, what you're doing, the gospel is your motivator with your family, at work. There's a presence of Christ in you that you're not ashamed of, that you're excited about. And, and this was Paul. This, this was what was driving him. Later he was imprisoned again under Rome. Uh, and if you wanted to read about that experience, that's 2 Timothy. That's the last book that Paul wrote and was uh, most likely executed directly after that. But even there, he's incurred. He knows that his time is, is coming to an end. Uh, he says right in chapter 4, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. The time my departure has come. I fought the good fight. He goes through all that. He knows that the executioner blade from Nero is, is drawing near to him. He knows his time is short. But he still continues to encourage the saints. It, it doesn't matter to Paul whether it's his first day as a Christian or his last day. He's going to have the biggest impact he possibly can for the sake of the gospel dynamically driven. And in this context, as he's in house arrest, he's writing to Philemon and saying, I, I want to bring you guys together. I want, to, I want to see you reconciled in Christ. This great offense that has taken place, I want to see Christ be the link, and I want to show a witness to the world right here as to how brothers in Christ overcome great offenses. See, Paul is dynamically driven by the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second person I want to look at is Onesimus. Onesimus was radically changed by the gospel. Radically changed. Let's, let, again, we know this about Onesimus. He was a slave. He took some things from his owner. Uh, he made a mess of, of things enough that when he did what he did, he ran all the way to Rome. That's over a thousand miles all right, from where he was at in Colossae. Now, that, that's, that's a long way to run. And somehow, through the providence of God, he runs into Paul. And under Paul's witness, he is saved and transformed uh, radically. L listen to what Paul has to say about him, starting in verse 10. We'll read through verse 13. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus. And here's where we learn that uh, Onesimus was the offspring spiritually of, Saul, of Paul. Paul witnessed to him and changed him. O Onesimus believed in the Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel, through the witness of Paul. And his name is, uh, it, it means useful. And you're going to see Paul play a little pun in here with his name. So Onesimus, useful, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and, and to me. Again, just some wordplay with his name there. Verse 12, I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. Paul likes this guy. Paul believes in him. He is telling Philemon, Onesimus is a, a productive tool, a, a great servant for Christ. I would keep him here if I felt that was the right thing to do, to continue to serve alongside me as a missionary, for him to proclaim the word of God. This man is showing some real change in his life, and it's having a profound impact on my ministry out here. Something has happened to Onesimus. He has been radically changed 
by the gospel. In fact, we learn here that it was Onesimus who brought this letter back to Philemon. See, o Onesimus was no longer running away from his problems. Now changed by the gospel, Onesimus was going to face his problems head on, holding Christ's right hand. He was going to walk through this and be strengthened and helped by the, 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 the arm of Christ. So he was, he was now no longer running away from his problems. He was facing them uh, with the confidence of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. He was, he was ready to do what was right, no matter the consequences. This is called lordship. Onesimus ran away from Colossae, living for Onesimus. But he turned around after an encounter with the gospel, living for Jesus. Different management. And the lifestyle changed completely. Now this was a big step for Onesimus because he could be beaten, he could be flogged, he could be executed for what he did. But what mattered most to him was that he was in the will of God. So he was willing to do what was right, no matter what the consequences were. So we, we see this life of Onesimus radically changed by the gospel from a runaway slave who was a thief to someone who was carrying the gospel as a presence with him, going back uh, to make amends to those he had hurt so that Christ might receive the glory. Radically changed by the gospel. Let's talk about Philemon. Philemon was continuously shaped by the gospel. Let me, let me talk to you about what that means. Let's, let's pick up in verse 14. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the, in the flesh and in the Lord? Okay, now this is... This is Paul talking to Philemon. And I, I think Paul pulls out an argument here that Philemon might not have been very excited about. This is what, in, in less words, this is what Paul says. Philemon, think of it this way. Maybe the reason that Onesimus, that God granted him uh, that departure from you, where he got all the way to me and he found me, and I was able to witness to him and change his life, and now he's headed back to you. Maybe this whole thing happened and was orchestrated by God so that he would receive the glory. The providence of God. Right? Romans 8, 28. We, we know that verse. And, uh, we know that all things work out to those who love the Lord who are called according to his purposes. But Paul's saying, I see the hand of God in this finding. I, I see, I think I see where God was going with this. I think he allowed this to happen just to set this up so that he could be glorified. No pressure, though, Philemon. <laughs> I don't know how excited Philemon would have felt about this. It's that old argument from Genesis 50-20 where Joseph says, you know, you guys meant this for evil, but God used it for good. It's that whole idea. Hey, Onesimus wasn't thinking for anybody's good here, Philemon, but his own. But I think God's going to turn this whole thing around where it ultimately glorifies him. And so he's, he's, he's using that argument on Philemon. Now we also learn here that Philemon was saved under Paul's witness. Uh, we already know that he's a great encourager from the first part of this uh, book. And, and, and what I want you to see here is Paul is using the, the message of the gospel, this call of grace, to continually challenge Philemon's life. Sometimes we think the gospel is, is kind of like for that day one of, of, of a Christian's life. It's for that day when you get saved. And then it's on to bigger, better things. I want you to understand that the gospel is, is, is present in every single day of the Christian. We, we are constantly reminded of the forgiveness that was extended to us. The mercy that was extended to us. The grace that was shown to us. And as we are constantly reminded of that, we are encouraged to show that now to others. And that the gospel doesn't just serve us on day one of our salvation. It is a continual reminder of God's love for us and how he wants to love others through us. Jesus shares even in the Lord's Prayer, the basic fundamental prayer that all Christians uh, should be able to connect to. Jesus says, look, when you do that, pray to your Father and say, forgive uh, my debts as I have forgiven my debtors. This is just expected of us, that we are a forgiving people. And Philemon is being challenged through the, through the gospel right now that he would be a forgiving person. Now this, this is no easy task. 
Uh, I think one thing that, uh, that can help us with this, because last week we talked about identifying your own Onesimus, that person that uh, that is that a real difficult spot in your life that where forgiveness needs to be extended, where it's a constant source of uh, a, kind of a tool in, in your life where, where God is using that uh, to teach you and to grow you and develop you. In Matthew 25, verse 40, uh, it's the scene of, of Jesus at the judgment. And he is talking about those things that you, you did for other people when you when you visited them in jail, when you gave them a cup of water, when, when, you know, when you did any of these things to the least of these, it's as though you did them to me. What Jesus is saying is this would apply in, in Philemon's case. However, Philemon is going to receive Onesimus, now a brother in Christ, certainly one of the least of these, a runaway slave and a thief. Not very high up on the social ladder here. In, in, in classes in a society. But however Philemon is going to receive Onesimus, now that he's a brother in Christ, this is how he will receive Christ. This, this is going to be charged to his account. He is one of the least of these. Now, I just want to extend that to you as you're dealing with some of the people in your life, the brothers and sisters in Christ. How we deal with the least of these, uh, that, that is, it's though we're dealing with Christ himself in this way. Whenever we talk about Christian forgiveness, it always sounds like a really great idea and, and logical and a wonderful thing until I'm the one that has to deal with it, right? When I'm the one that has to forgive, then it's like, oh, uh, man, this is a different story here. This, this, you know, there's different things playing where, where, where this is extremely difficult and it's not fun at all. And it, 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 I don't know if I need to go through with this. Certainly God has some parameters on this. Though, though God has shown quite clearly in his conversation with Peter how often we forgive, uh, the, the parable of the wicked servant, how deep we forgive, there are no parameters. Not unforgiveness for the Christian. We forgive as many times and as deeply as it takes to bring reconciliation back into our relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ. Now what I want you to see in this letter is that, that Paul is someone who, who builds people up. Uh, he, is, he, is, he is giving worth to Onesimus. He's trying to help Philemon out here because Philemon is being asked to reconcile this broken relationship, to overlook and forgive the offense. And Paul is asking in his own name, I want you to do this for me so that Christ receives the glory. But the way that he does it is he builds Onesimus up. He talks about the value that he now has because he bears the image of Christ. Because he is now the, the spiritual offspring of Paul. Because he has responded to the gospel. Because he is now living in obedience to the Lord. Paul is building Onesimus up so that Philemon uh, can, can love this man and, and, and go through with this process of reconciliation. A side note here. If we wanted to do the opposite of the book of Philemon, it, it's called gossip. It is the opposite in where instead of taking someone who is down and, and feeding worth into that, hey, this is someone who has been saved by Christ, who Christ died for, who Christ has, has, has uh, forgiven, who is filled with the Spirit. Uh, Paul is doing all these things to build worth into someone, and our worth is found in Christ. We can do the very opposite as Christians by taking someone and beginning to tear down instead of building up. Can you believe this person did that? You know, I can remember a few weeks ago when they said this. And we begin to talk about the faults and the character of this person. And rather than building them up and, 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 and giving them worth so that we can love them, we begin to tear them down with the motivation, whether we would say it or not. The motivation is, so, is to prove that they're unlovable. This person is not worth our love. There's no worthiness of this person for us to extend grace, mercy, or love to. That is that is the goal of gossip. That is what we are accomplishing when we speak negatively about people, when we tear them down. There's a difference between tearing someone down and confronting in love someone's sin. And man, we struggle with that. And most of us would not consider ourselves gossips. And yet, you can probably think back to a time when you caught yourself. Some people were talking about someone who had some issues. And they rubbed them the wrong way. And now they were starting to tear down uh, the worth of that person. How do you respond? 
I just want to encourage you because the, the book of Philemon, Paul shows us how to build worth into somebody. But our, our, our natural selves, we, we want to tear people down because as they're going down, it feels like we're going up. Man, I guess I'm better off than they are. I'm glad I'm not like that. But I, I just want to tell you, Christians, there is nothing more offensive and nothing more destructive in God's kingdom. Because Jesus' purpose is to impart value to us. I had no value, and yet Jesus filled me with his worthiness. And now I am uh, valued infinitely. As we look at our bond with other Christians in Christ, it is not our job to take away the value and the worth that Jesus poured into them. That's counterproductive. That's working against Christ. Gossip is not one of those little sins. It's a major one. So I, I just want to encourage you, as we look at Paul's example, be an encourager. As we look at Philemon's example in verses 4 through 7, uh, he has someone where he's building people up, encouraging them. I, I can't stress to you enough, Cornerstone, how important that is, that we be a church, that we be a body of believers where we see the value and the worth in people and not focus on the flaws. Every one of us in here has flaws. We, we could spend some time and just go around the room. We all got them. We can focus on them. We can make a big deal out of them. I, I want to encourage you. We can also look at the worthiness of Christ in each one of us. And we can focus on what God is doing in our lives and how he has changed us. But we make the decision. You make the decision as to what kind of focus you're going to have. But the decision you make will have a profound effect on the atmosphere in this family. Profound. And sometimes churches get caught up in that negativity and the, and the gossip and the tearing down. And the next thing you know, you walk into a church like that and you can almost just feel the judgment heaping down on you. Man, I just, I, 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 it's not a place anyone wants to be. God, ex God invites us to be a place of love. A, a place that reaches out and sees the value in people. And not a place that excuses and justifies sin, but a, a place that starts with love as the starting place. And doesn't jump on the sin as a, as a place to start beating on people right off the bat. That's not where we want to be. We love people and then the Spirit of God works through us to begin to sharpen one another. The Spirit convicts us and we grow together. So this is where we're at with Philemon. He is continuously shaped by the gospel. It wasn't just for when he got saved. Even now he's being called upon to extend the kind of grace and mercy that was once shown to him. All right, I've got one last guy, and he's a weird guy. I'll confess that. All right. Demas. We'll throw Demas in here. Though we could have chose uh, anyone from his, his closer, his closing letter here. But I, let, let, me, let me explain why. Let me read uh, beginning in verse uh, 22. As Paul closes out his letter. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers... I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Epaphras was just a, another mission worker there, another ministry worker in the church. He sends his greetings to you. He was out with Paul. Verse 24, and so do Mark. You know, Paul and Mark had their differences at one point, and they were reconciled through that. And Paul now considers him a faithful witness, as he does in 2 Timothy. Aristarchus, which if we read Colossians 4.10, is just another co-laborer in the faith, another church worker out there, another one working the fields. Demas, which we'll talk about. And Luke, who was the physician that took care of, uh, who took care of Paul's ills, whatever issues he had. We, we believe from Galatians, remember that? He had some stuff going on with his eyes and, and, and through all the beatings he received, who knows what all Paul was dealing with. But Luke stayed faithful with Paul. And he wrote the book of Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts. So Luke was very instrumental in advancing the gospel. All these are my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So what about Demas? We know that Demas, during this time, when Paul wrote this letter, was, was one part of the crew that was working, part, part of those that were out there ministering and, and doing the labor to advance the kingdom. However, unfortunately for Demas... At the end of Paul's ministry, uh, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it, it gives 
That's Paul's final testimony about Demas. And this is what he says. He says, Demas has deserted me for the love of the world. Hmm. Isn't that an awful way to finish? Demas has deserted me. In 2 Timothy, things were not as popular as they were right now. In 2 Timothy, Paul was at the end of his life. He was about to be executed. People were running for their lives. And Demas, at a time when Paul needed a friend the most, forsook him, forsook the gospel, and went out and chased the things in the world that were of greater interest and benefit to him. He left and abandoned and deserted the gospel for the sake of the world. I, I, I want to just speak to you about Demas because Demas leaves an, an impression. And, and, and when we talk about how he was affected by the gospel, Demas was eternally unchanged by the gospel. Just because you have an encounter with the gospel does not mean that your eternal destiny is forever changed. Matthew chapter 13 talks about all different ways people encounter the gospel. All with joy. But it's not until the gospel gets from your head deep into your heart and the roots anchor there and Christ comes into the heart and slays you and you are now His. You've been conquered by Christ. It is now Christ who lives in me. No longer I, but Christ. When that happens, the gospel is the door that unlocks that. And when that happens, our eternal destiny is changed. But many people uh, have this encounter with the gospel and they, they peek out and they see Christ. And, and rather than allowing Christ to come in uh, and, and, and rule their life completely, they just give him some rental space. Okay, Jesus, you can be Lord over this area and this area, but leave this section of my life alone. Thank you. That is not lordship. Nor is that salvation. That when, when we talk about what it means to be slain for Christ, I want you to look at Onesimus. Onesimus running away over a thousand miles away from his owner, running from his problems, encounters Christ, turns back around, and does what's right. A complete 180, literally, for Onesimus. That's what an encounter with Christ that changes our lives to the point of eternity looks like. And, and, and here, Demas doesn't seem to demonstrate that. Matthew 24, 12 through 13, it's a chapter in Matthew about uh, uh, the end times. It says, because of the increase in wickedness, the hearts of many will grow cold. But those who persevere to the end will be saved. That's not a description of Demas. And again, Jesus describes what Demas demonstrated uh, in, in uh, Matthew 13, verse 22. He was one of the seeds that landed in the thorns. And rather than the gospel growing up and producing fruit, it was covered by the thorns. And, and it, that represented the, the lure of the world, the lure of wealth, things of this world that take our, our eyes off of Christ. Never giving the gospel deep enough roots to transform us from the inside out to where we're truly living for Christ and no longer ourselves. This is what happened to Demas. Demas got to the end of his life and chose another direction. You know, I'm always blown away by Christians, and I've heard this said several times, several times. I've put in my time. You ever heard a Christian say that? I've put in my time. I served six years in the nursery. Time for someone else to do this. I don't need to do anything anymore. It's time for the next generation. I tell you what, can you imagine telling Paul that? I mean, he sat, in, he sat in prison for how many years of his life, beaten within an inch of his life, three missionary journeys. At what point did Paul say, hey, I've done my time, earned my retirement, time for some of these new young upstarts that I got going to do the work? No. As long as Paul had breath in his body, he was going to serve the Lord. What do you mean, Christian, that you've done your time? If you are still breathing, you have not finished your time. And, and, and let me add some clarity here. Do you know on the day of judgment, when we stand before Christ, do you know what our reward is? More responsibility and service to the king. 
So if we are rewarded in our faithful service to him uh, at the end of this life by being given additional service in areas of responsibility for eternity ever after. There, there is no break from serving God. We are meant to find our fulfillment and our joy in serving God. Don't be a demon and just walk away at the end. Hey, someone else can do this. I don't need to serve anymore. It's time for me to be served, right? That's what Jesus said, right? I came to be served, not to serve. Wait, I got that backwards, didn't I? Right now, now come on. If Jesus says, I have come not to be served, but to serve others, how can any of us say that? We must be a serving church. We must be a Christians who do not walk away from the calling that God has placed on us and go into retirement mode early. We are to serve God to the day that we die. And God intends for us to enjoy that. Is there time of sacrifice? Yes. Is there time of trial and pain in that? Yes. But there's also a great time of reward. And it's our faithfulness in these areas that bring about the reward. <coughs> So I wonder, as we look through all these characters today, who would you close, most closely relate to? Are you a Paul who is uh, dynamically driven by the gospel? Do you see that the presence of God in your life, no matter where you're at, it doesn't matter? There's just a pride in you that Christ is my Savior. There's a drive in you that others should know about Him. And that even extends into the relationships for Paul, where when he sees a brother and a brother, or a sister and a sister, uh, that are off kilter with one another, and they're out of sync, they're out of relationship, he steps in in a sacrificial way and says, I want to bring this together for the glory of God. Maybe that's you here this morning. Or, or maybe you're an Onesimus, and God has changed your life, praise God, but you're looking back, and there's some amends that need to take place. There's some offenses in your life where it, it, it's time to stop running and start to make good decisions. It's, start, it, it's time to start doing the right thing, no, no matter the consequences. Maybe that's you this morning. Be bold like Onesimus. Don't worry about the consequences. Do what's right. Give the consequences to God. If that's you this morning, God will reward your obedience. Trust Him. Just trust Him. Maybe you're in Philemon's position and someone has wounded you and, and done you wrong. And, and right now you're struggling to see the value in that person. You can see the flaws. They're screaming at you. And it's, it's just tough to extend forgiveness to this person. It's tough to even think about reconciliation. All you can see is the glaring fa faults. I want to encourage you, Christian. Don't forget that they are the least of these. There is worth in them. It, this is a process. This is something that we don't just go through the motions. Uh, and, and we're going to get to that. Remember I told you at the end, we're going to talk about a final key, a puzzle piece that's hidden in the book of Philemon that you need to know to make all this work. Finally, maybe you're a Demas. Maybe you're, just, you're out of just cruise control right now. You're not, you're not serving anyone or anywhere. You, you put your time in, and at this point it's just become a ritualistic habit. I come to church every Sunday morning. I come here. I get out. I do my duty before God. That's not your duty before God. This is where God speaks to us. And He encourages us. And He motivates us to obey. To expand His kingdom. To be filled with His Spirit. To live the abundant life that He has for us. But maybe you're a demon and you just kind of quietly inside you walked away from all. There's no real commitment left. I just want to encourage you. This might be a morning that you have to examine hard your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what that looks like. If your faith is defined by your church attendance, that, that has nothing to do with, with your day of judgment, with your day of salvation, with the turning point in your life. This is just a tool to help God reach into your life and bring about the changes that he wants to do in you. But to, to bring about the truths of the gospel to take root in you. Your church attendance does not impress God. So as, as we're looking at all these people and trying to find our place, well, where do we take the next step of obedience? Uh, before you take that step, I want you to look at verse 9. Three words here. You've you got to get this. If you've got a pen, circle it. A highlighter, color it in. 
Verse 9, yet for love's sake, I appeal to you. For love's sake, before Paul does anything here, it is rooted in love. Here, here's the secret to the key. That, that you, if you get this, it's going to help you immensely in your, in your attempts to bring reconciliation, whether it's to people in God or people to people. Are you ready for it? Here it is. People are not projects to be fixed. And if you approach people as projects to be fixed, you're going to make the situation worse. People are objects of God's love. And therefore, they must be objects of our love. And when you can get to that place, you're now ready to start taking the baby steps of reconciliation. But if you skip that step, your intentions might be good, but you can do such great damage. Whether it's in trying to reconcile someone to God, if you don't love that person, that's going to come through in your communication. They're going to pick that up. You're a sinner. You've messed up. You're headed to hell. You need a savior. We can beat people with a gospel club. It doesn't work. Unless you're doing it in love. Right? That, that, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. It, it, it tells us that everything that we are to do must be done out of love. There is nothing greater than love. And if we try to do anything outside of love, you're like a tinkling cymbal. You're a meaningless sound. You're your fingernails on the chalkboard. Don't go there. Don't try to fix relationships like that. Whether you're trying to reconcile someone to Christ or, or, or someone to yourself or, or two people together, if you're not... If you're not invested in these people to the point that you love them, it's not going to work. It's going to backfire, and you're going to have a mess on your hands. So you can't fix someone else when you're broken yourself. And as servants of Christ, if you don't love, genuinely love your brothers and sisters in Christ, you're broken. You're broken. So there's a disconnect somewhere, and you're not honoring the Lord with your heart. We've got to overcome that. But that is step one. So when you identify the Onesimus in your life, you, you've got to start building worth into them. When, when you see two people that you want to invest in, you, you need to be willing to, to love them to the point that you're going to set, you're be willing to sacrifice, invest your own skin in this to make this work so that God gets the glory. And if you're a Demas, what's happened is you've fallen out of love with the Lord. You're going through the motions. But it's empty. And you can run on willpower for so long, but you may end up like one of those countless other professing Christians who did their time in church and now sleep in on Sundays and are, are just completely disconnected from the body of Christ. The gospel is nowhere close on their list of priorities to those things that are important in their life. Some of us need that wake-up call, that reality check. You need to hear the voice of God saying to you this morning, Come on back. We need to get this fixed. We need to get this right before you just kind of fade out to a poor finish. You might have started great, but it's how we finish that matters. So as we look at all these different characters in, in this book, I want, I want you to look inside your own heart. This is the Word of God. It's living and active. It is meant to hit your heart and, and do some damage. It's supposed to rattle our cages a little bit. It's supposed to tell us, wake up, I've got a word for you. And as the Spirit goes into our hearts, the, the Bible says that the, the word of God does not, uh, it does not become void. It accomplishes that what it, it, it tends to do. But let the Spirit speak to you this morning. Where are you in all these characters, and what is God asking you to do? And if it's in the process of reconciliation, my, my, my advice again is make sure you start with yourself. Make sure... That this, this love exists in you. That, that you look at that person, you see value, you see importance. And as you go from there, you'll be in good territory. You'll be in a place where the Spirit of God can use you. Don't skip that step. And if you're a demon this morning, if you're someone who's just, you're here, you're going through the motions, you're, 
you've got your church attendance down, you're a good person. It, it, is there a, a fire in you, though, that will last to the end? Is, is the gospel got a, a hold on you, a grip on your heart that's changing you so that you're no longer your own, but you answer to God alone? It, is that you this morning? Because, because if it's not, I, I'm telling you, over and over here, we, we see the Spirit just whisper in those hearts, God loves you so much, you can't imagine the plans that He has for your life. There is a purpose and there's meaning for you being here this morning, but you've got to listen to the Spirit of God. And you've got to humble your heart and confess your need for a Savior. And accept God's forgiveness and let Him start new with you. Where, where, where are you at this morning? Would you allow the Spirit of God to speak to your heart? And let's, as a body, respond in obedience. And God will get the glory. Just like the story of Philemon. That letter could probably be written to just about anyone in here. So let's let the Spirit of God work in our hearts. And let's leave here as servants of Christ who have committed to obey the Lord's voice when we recognize it in our hearts. Let me pray for you for this morning. Father, right now, as a church family, we just bow before you. We confess our love for you. We thank you for your word to us. We thank you that this is not a boring words written in ancient texts that we just recite for ritual, but these words speak to us and change us. We thank you for that, Lord. You are a living God. And right now, your spirit speaks to ours. And we submit to your instruction. We respond to your conviction. We are yours, Lord. Do in our hearts what you intend to do, and let us be found faithful. While your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, and you're listening for the Lord's instruction in your own life, let me speak to you this morning. If you're struggling in the area of your own salvation, do you know that if you were to die this morning, that you would spend all eternity in heaven? Do you know that for sure? Have you been to the cross and been washed clean by the blood of Christ, asking forgiveness and being cleansed of every sin you've ever committed, receiving Jesus by faith into your heart, and as a result, having all of his righteousness replace all of your sin. That's where we gain our worth as a Christian. It's all about Jesus. When you look in your heart this morning, is it all about Jesus? Has his mark been left there? Or do you need to respond to him this morning? I'm telling you, the Spirit of God wants so badly for you to respond to the command of the, of the gospel. Repent and believe. Confess to God that you are a sinner. Accept Jesus Christ by faith as your Lord and Savior. As many are praying in here right now, I'm just going to invite you as your first step of faith towards God and acknowledgement that God needs to do something in your life with no one looking around. Would you just place your hand in the air and say, Pastor, would you just pray for me? I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. Would you just acknowledge before God, God, I, I think I need to make a decision in my life. I, I need to have Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Anyone in here, raise your hand. This is so important. God is speaking to your heart right now. Don't be ashamed of Him. I promise I won't point you out. I'm not here to embarrass you. I'm, I'm here to help you. If God is speaking in your heart, I want you to respond to that. One last time, I'm going to ask, is anyone here this morning, can, can you feel the Spirit of God working in you? Do you need to respond to the call of the gospel that Jesus would be your Lord and Savior? Would you just put your hand up in the air for me to see? Anyone here this morning? No hands have gone up. So Christians, let me speak to you for a moment because we've waded through some difficult territory this morning. This whole process of reconciling relationships. It all starts with love. Are you loving the people that God has placed in your life? Are you able to look at that person who has caused you pain and love them because God loved them? That's where the journey of forgiveness has to start. 
Father, I do pray for each one here this morning. I believe your word is relevant and meaningful to each of us as we sit under your instruction. Help us to apply it in a way, Father, that brings you glory. We want to be found obedient as your servants. We pray this in Jesus' name.